Mm, okay. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to week three. Uh, what's today? The 25th of January. Uh, welcome. And I hope you guys are doing good. I hope you had a nice weekend, got some rest and got some work done because you have some homework that's due today. Um, you have your first major assignment that's due today by noon. If you haven't gotten started on that already, you got a hell of a shock ahead of you. Uh, so uh, it's going to be a fun morning for you. Um, even if you don't get it in right away, please make sure you're getting your work in, okay? Um, I haven't looked yet to see how many people have got that in. It's quite a bit of work. So what you're doing, though, is you're building your own historical glossary, and this is all exam prep, okay? You're simply preparing yourself for the exam to come, so it's going to be much easier once the exams come if you're doing this work. If you're not, you've seen. If you don't do the work, you don't pass college classes, okay? And, and I got to tell you, it's really easy to put a zero in that grade book and just move on. Please don't be that person. Get your work in. Do it. That's the only way to succeed in college, in life, and all that stuff. So, okay. Um, if you have any questions about that, please, you know, stay after. Let me know, or you can shoot me an email if you got any questions about that. Uh, make sure you're following the instructions, and uh, uh, good luck. I think I, I look forward to seeing what you guys create. Okay, so we're we're quite a bit behind, but you know, whatever, we'll get it figured out. We'll probably get caught up this week. I want to pick up our story where we left off last time looking at the scientific revolution. Okay, so let me pull that bad boy up here. Let me just two shakes of a lamb's tail. And so we're going to continue looking at this. And then hopefully today we're also going to dive into the age of exploration, which is going on at the same time, but it's a very different topic. So what I'm asking you to do and what we're going to do throughout this course is we're building layers. So, you know, while this is going on in this part of the world, this is also going on in the same part of the world and something different is going on in other parts of the world. You're building, like geology, you're digging down and you're building your own understanding of what's going on in the past. But I wanna start here with the scientific revolution. This is where we ended last time. And this is the beginning of what we call rationalism. Basing your life and your actions on reason, on evidence, proven quality evidence, not what you read in a blog, but what has been worked out through the scientific method. And there's a significant difference between, and you guys know this, anything that's published on the internet and real scientific academic work. There's a significant difference. Yes, maybe one guy died from the vaccine. Does that mean it's going to kill everybody? No. And freaking out because one guy died from a vaccine means you don't know history because every vaccine has killed at least one person. So that doesn't mean the vaccine is invalid. There's a difference there. OK, but anyway, that's a, my own little thing I've got going on with an uncle of mine. The dude. Anyway, you all have that uncle, right? Everybody's got that guy. OK, so. This idea of using, instead of religion to explain everything, evidence and rationality. These are very different approaches to life. And we see that carried out, especially through Isaac Newton, earlier through Copernicus and, and so many others. But then let's take that idea, applying rational thinking to science and to the physical world. And then let's take that same idea and apply it to the human world. And this is where you get my next and one of the, my favorite periods in all of European history, and that is the Enlightenment. I don't know why I typed that out. It's right freaking here. The Enlightenment is simply the application of scientific principles to human relationships. So this is where we get many of the social sciences, like what I teach today, what history, psychology, sociology, anthropology, all of these, in which we're applying the scientific method to human interactions. This, this gives us some of, the, some of my personal favorite of all the great writers of this period. My personal favorite a guy named John Locke, L-O-C-K-E. You can see here, this is one of his major essays, Two Treaties on Government. This is where we get the idea of a modern, what we call a democracy, but what's really a republic. 
the idea that it's better to have a whole lot of people share power than one corrupt ruler with all of the authority. That's kind of, it seems like, what the last administration was going for. Give one man all the power, no responsibility, and you can do whatever you want. Well, that's kind of a problem because you can't check that power. When power is shared among many different people, the people have more access to that power. It's not perfect. Nobody ever said it was, but it's the best of a bad choice, okay? That's the same thing that Plato said about democracy or really about a Republican government. My personal favorite of all of these guys, of these uh, uh, Enlightenment thinkers, is a guy named James Hutton. James Hutton was a farmer, okay? He was just a regular farmer, but he had read a lot of these other treaties and he learned how to think correctly, not what to think, but how to think. We call it empiricism. That is making decisions based off large bodies of data, not single examples, but large bodies of data. So yeah, everybody knows, like, like I had an uncle who died in a rollover accident and he died because he couldn't get his seatbelt off and he was hung upside down and he eventually passed out, lost enough blood and he died. Does that mean seat belts are bad? No, it's, they've literally saved millions of lives because one guy dies because he can't get out of his seat belt doesn't make seat belts bad, okay? Same logic, same argument. So Hutton actually observed the physical world and for centuries, the Catholic church had taught that the earth was about 6,000 years old. If you go through the Bible, especially the book of Numbers, they quite literally went through the genealogy, estimated how long people lived, and concluded that the earth was 6,000 years old. Problem is, geology and science tell us exactly the opposite. Hutton couldn't figure out why he was finding fossils of fish on top of mountains. That doesn't make sense. Why, why, would, why would a fish be on top of a mountain? And not just one, but schools of them. And so he develops the modern science of geology, and he writes a book called The Theory of the Earth. And at the time, this was groundbreaking, arguing that the Earth is not thousands of years old, but billions of years old. Now, here's the thing. Science backs up Hutton, and we know now that the Earth is about 4.6 billion years old. This is also where we get some of the great political philosophers of their day. One of my personal favorite is uh, uh, David Hume. Uh, and there are tons of these. We can keep doing this all day. Another of the big thinkers of this period is Adam Smith. Now, a lot of people like to quote Adam Smith uh, as, as this great father of capitalism. But actually, if you read him, he hated capitalism. He argued that it was just it was as bad as a Republican form of government. It's the best of a bad choice. And in fact, he famously said that capitalism destroys everything and there, it's only left with one winner and it destroys everything else. I'm not sure that that's exactly the ideal system. But again, using evidence to argue, probably of all of these the most important of these thinkers of the Enlightenment is Voltaire. What he did was he wanted to gather, uh, let's see if I can spell today, a collection of all of this new knowledge that is exploding out of the scientific revolution, out of the Enlightenment. And so he creates the first encyclopedia. This is this massive compendium of knowledge that most people use, not just as the end of their research, but unfortunately, well, not just the beginning, but oftentimes people today use that as the end of their research. This was just intended to be a starting point, where to get a kind of basic understanding of something so you could move on to gain a more detailed, nuanced understanding of this. All of these men, and they were all men, OK, the scientific revolution, the Enlightenment was incredibly sexist. OK, they didn't believe women were capable of rational thought. But that's also because they wouldn't allow women to get an education. Women were barred from schools and universities. So they weren't trained in this type of thinking. So it's kind of like. It's kind of like judging a four year old for not being able to write a symphony. 
Well, of course they can't. And you judging them for not being able to do that kind of makes you an ass, doesn't it? So that's part of the problem here. But be that as it may, all of these men want a more rational, reasonable approach to life. But they don't really have any power. The people who have the power are kings and queens. And in Europe at this time, at this time, these kings and queens are claiming absolute authority. Then so we call them absolute monarchs. And probably the best example that we can think of in world history is Louis the 14th. You can see him there. Check out that outfit for just a minute. I mean, look at this thing. Like the, the pantyhose, I mean, hot, right? Who doesn't like a guy that wears those? Uh, and, and no insult, if that's your thing, do you, boo-boo. Look at this coat. I mean, that fur, this thing is, okay. So what Louis wants to do here, Louis wants to claim absolute control over his country, and that's France. But he has this problem that every king at the time has. The people who actually have the land and the power and the wealth in Europe at this time are the aristocracy. Think about it today in America. Is the president really the most powerful person in the country? No. Jeff Bezos is probably the most powerful person in this country. Bill Gates, the billionaires, the soon-to-be trillionaires, they're really the ones running the show. They're the ones paying off the politicians, and they're doing just fine while not paying taxes. Okay. The same thing was true with, with Europe at the time. So for kings to become absolutely powerful, they had to gain control over the monarchy, and Louis figures out how to do this. First, he builds a massive palace. This is the Palace of Versailles. This sits just outside of Paris. It's a huge tourist destination. Has anybody been to, to Versailles? I've been there twice. Has anybody been to Versailles? Uh, you can go on virtual tours. Just type in virtual tour Versailles and you can go check this out. It is ridiculous. For example, this room right here. This is called the Hall of Mirrors. And it's a massive room, but it's made to look even bigger because on both walls, it's lined with these mirrors. And these, I mean, look at all of these crystal chandeliers. That's literal gold on those walls. It is lined with gold and precious metals and precious and rubies. And okay, how rich do you have to be to start painting your walls in real gold, not gold like spray on, real gold? And then like, hey, I'd like to put a diamond there and a ruby there and I don't know, maybe some some I don't know, some precious stones there. I mean, how rich do you have to be? So not only does he have this massive palace built, there's huge grounds around it, a, a massive garden. And then he requires that every monarch and every, excuse me, every aristocrat and their family live at Versailles. And so now the aristocracy is spending their time living at Versailles and their money too. And th that means that they're far away from their home estates. And Louis figures out to, to distract these people. Uh, every month, a new fashion comes out. And so the ladies need new dresses and, and there's games to be played and, and all of this. And this is how he ends up getting absolute control over the kingdom of France. And Louis is not interested in sharing power in these enlightenment ideas. So mostly what we see instead are, well, absolute kings. Now, there's hope. There are a few monarchs. This is Frederick the First or Frederick the Great. He comes from a country that will become Germany, but today at this point it's called Prussia. Okay. Not Russia, Prussia. Don't ask why. That's just what it's called. Okay. But notice that, that his country is there's chunks of it here and there's chunks of it over here. And it's not a united country. Now, Frederick and, and other monarchs at the time, another of my personal favorite uh, comes out of Russia, Catherine the Great. They, they, they're aware of these Enlightenment ideas, these ideas of setting up parliaments and sharing power and Republican government. And they toy with these ideas. And that's why they're often called Enlightened despots. 
some of them introduce radical new ideas. For instance, Frederick of, of Prussia, Frederick the Great, he introduces social security. That idea that you pay a little bit in your taxes, the government holds that, and then when you're old enough, you get to retire and not starve to death. That's an idea that wasn't started by FDR in the 1930s. He just copied the idea for Frederick of Prussia in the late 18th century. So these ideas had already been around for quite some time. They're not going to be able, these, these monarchs of Europe are not going to be able to resist these ideas because one of the greatest changes we're seeing, and we'll look at this, that it, it connects very much to the age of exploration, is this great commercial expansion. In the 17th and 18th century, Europe is conquering or setting up colonies all over the world. And very quickly, this is starting to make Europe, instead of the poorest and smallest continent in the world, while it doesn't get bigger as a continent, their empires begin to expand around the world and money is flooding into these countries. And this leads to a system that is known as mercantilism. And if you're not writing things down, that's a big one. This is a precursor to capitalism. We're not quite there yet. Instead, here, this is where the state and business work hand in hand. For example, we see this in the American uh, Revolution. There's a company called the British East India Company. If you've ever watched any of the uh, Pirates of the Caribbean, you'll see their symbol burned into everything. Technically, it's the British West India Company, but whatever, okay? This company was going bankrupt. And so they went to the Queen of England and she loaned them the British military and Navy. Can you imagine that? Imagine if Jeff Bezos wanted to get rid of his competition. So he went to the president. He's like, yo, Prez, can I borrow the Marines to go kill all of my enemies? Wouldn't that be kind of badass? Do you see how much power that is? When you combine industry and gov government with industry, you have almost an unstoppable force. But both are connected. Both are tied into the benefits and the growth of each other. They're invested in their own success. So Europe is starting to change. By the 17th and certainly into the 18th century, family, family life is changing as well. Now, at some point, it's going to be expected that you're supposed to get your own job, move out of your parents' house and establish your own household, and then maybe have your own kids, get married, whatever, okay? That's unique in history, okay? Through most of history until this modern age, you lived with your parents until they died. And same with your grandparents. Everybody across multiple generations lived in one household. But by the 18th century, with all of this wealth pouring into Europe, that changes where young people are supposed to go out and make it on their own, maybe with some help from mom and dad. But now it's your job to go out and establish your own life. I don't know if that's better, but it's certainly different. But one of the big differences is an idea oh, that we call romance. Oh, see, before the 18th century, every marriage in Europe and almost every marriage in the world was arranged. Now, raise your hand if you would trust your parents to pick your bride or your husband for you. Nobody. Jacob, you don't think mom would do a good job finding a hottie for you? No, I mean, that'd just be weird, wouldn't it? Son, this is who you're going to marry. Um, no. And today we don't, we don't marry based on a business arrangement. Like I think she'll be a really good worker and she's going to be really good at doing dishes and making my meals. I mean, that's seen as sexist today, right? But that wasn't the case in the past. It was a business arrangement is what marriage used to be. But today, instead, we base our marriages on love. Okay. Which is better. I will tell you that before this idea of romantic love, divorce almost didn't exist. Today, more than 50% of all marriages, most of which are based on romance, end in divorce. 
So which is more effective? I don't know. I still don't want my mom picking my my wedding. I just that's no. That's just weird. But just realize that that marriage is changing. The family is changing into what we call this nuclear family. But you need to realize that even with all of these new ideas, we still have many old ideas that are around. The Enlightenment, the, the scientific revolution, that's taking place way at the, the top levels of European society. The rich and the powerful are, can afford the time to sit around at night and observe the stars, okay? If you have to work for a living as a farmer, you're not staying up all night tracking Jupiter as it crosses across the sky. You're getting sleep so you can get your ass up in the morning and do your job again. So all of these people that we've been talking about so far really are the elites, for the common man, superstition, including the belief in witchcraft, was incredibly powerful. We know, especially during the wars of religion and as the scientific revolution and the enlightenment are going on, we have literally thousands of people being arrested and tried and executed as witches. Almost all of them are women. Now, there have been some, some recent studies, and a lot of these women who got burned at the stake were what, what we today would call a midwife. These were women that would assist other women during birth and then afterwards with nursing and, and that kind of care. So basic nurses. But at the same time, men were emerging as doctors coming out of formal training, universities and, and colleges. And so these women midwives were competing with men for the same business. Many of those women would then be accused of witchcraft, tried, and executed based on trials that weren't exactly fair. So yet another continuation. So things change, ideas change, societies change, but they don't entirely change, and they don't all change at the same time. A lot of times, old ideas remain hanging around for a long, long time. Okay, so uh, I want to turn our attention from that, and I want to start looking at the age of exploration. And again, we're going backwards, and we're going to be covering a lot of the same time period we looked at in these first couple of lectures, but from a different perspective and with a different point of view. So, hello, daughter. Do you want to say hi to all the kids? No. She doesn't want to. You sure a 14-year-old girl doesn't want to get on camera? Shocking. You would hate being my child. Oh, it's just awful. I'm terrible. Anyway, okay. So, age of exploration. I talked about this a little bit before, but I want to take our roots going back to about the year 1100. Technically, the year is 1090 or 1095, actually. 1095 is the year that the first crusade was called. And this was an attempt by the Christians in Europe, especially in France, to regain control or access to the Holy Land. These were the lands that Jesus walked during his life. And for centuries, Europeans had been going on pilgrimage to the Holy Lands, but there had been some changes, there had been some overthrow of local Muslim regimes, and they had cut off access. These Muslims were also attacking an empire here, it's called the Byzantine Empire. I'm just going to mention that because we will come back to these guys a little bit later. These Byzantines were also Christians, just different Christians. So, when Rome fell, when the Roman Empire fell, they basically split between the East here and the West there. The West is what became Catholic. But in the East, they called themselves Orthodox. And this is a different branch of Christianity. They tend to use Greek, they have different rites, and they recognize different leadership and different ideas. So much like many different branches of Christianity, they did not get along, okay? In fact, one of my favorite things, I love this. I hate that I'm, I get distracted by all these stories, but I kind of love this. There was what was called the Great Schism. And this lasted for quite some time. It's still technically around where the Pope in Rome over here, 
every Christmas day, he would sit down and he would write the leader of the Orthodox Church, who was here in Constantinople. He would write him a letter. Uh, and it was like, oh, dear patriarch, I, I hope you have a nice Christmas. I hope you got everything you want. By the way, you have been excommunicated. Which means you have been thrown out of the church and you're going, you're, you're doomed to hell. So that's one Christian leader dooming another Christian leader to hell for all of eternity. And so the next Christmas, the patriarch would write a letter back to the Pope. Dear Pope, I hope you got everything you wanted for Christmas. By the way, enjoy the hot fires of hell. So they're excommunicating each other every year. And this is known as the great schism, the great split in the Christian church. And it still exists to this day. So in 1095, all of this changes because Muslims are attacking Constantinople. And so the patriarch in Rome, just have you ever broken up with somebody and then regretted it and tried to fix it? Or have you ever, like, you know, said something that you really regretted and you go back and you try to apologize? Guys, once you burn that bridge, there's really no rebuilding it ever again, is there? So just imagine, we have a copy of this letter in which the patriarch in Constantinople is begging for help. Dear fellow Christian Pope, I embrace you with kindness and the love of Jesus. By the way, you wouldn't happen to have a spare army you could send my way to save my ass? from these unholy Muslims, would you? That is how the Crusades began. But they quickly got out of control. Uh, in fact, it would be Christian armies that would actually lay siege to and burn parts of the city of Constantinople. Crazy. It just gets insane. We don't have time to look at all the Crusades, but there's lots of great books on them. There are actually technically eight crusades, four major and four minor, and there's so many great stories. If you want to hear more, please take the first half of this class, 111. Uh, I, we go over a whole unit of it's fascinating. But for our purposes here, this is the first time in European history since the fall of Rome that Europeans are wandering outside of Europe and making connections. So think about this. Okay, so you're a merchant. You, you own a ship and you're living here in Italy and you get paid to sail these crusaders over to the Holy Land. Now, you're in a foreign country and you have all this money in your pocket and an empty ship. What are you going to do? Sean, what would you do? Let's think you're a good capitalist, good entrepreneur, anybody. Now, Sean, anybody, somebody needs to, to pipe up here. What would you do? You got an empty ship, a whole lot of money, and you're in a foreign land. What are you going to do? Um, probably go Try back. Home. Home. Hold on, let's, Taj was first. Go ahead. I'd probably just go back home. I don't have nothing to sell. Mm, uh, but you could, couldn't you? Who else? Uh, somebody else. Joshua, was that you? Uh, I you said, uh, oh, never mind. <laughs> Ashman, go ahead. Wait, you said an empty ship with a lot of money? What? Yeah. I mean, you, I mean, like, if, well, wait, like, mm, never mind. Go ahead. 20 seconds. Uh, okay. I thought, I thought no. I thought you said something else. So I was about to say, "Oh, I'm trying to take the land." But oh, simmer but, down. These aren't Native I, Americans. Yeah, I thought you said something else. So okay, okay. Here's what a good entrepreneur does: you go out to the local market and you buy stuff that you can't find back at home. Exotic goods, guys. These are markets that Europeans hadn't seen in 500 years. They had been isolated from the outside world, from the trade of the Silk Road and, and of all the rest of the world. And so these merchants began to trade for goods that they could find in the Holy Land that couldn't be found back in Europe. And they start bringing these goods back and selling them at incredibly inflated prices and making huge amounts of money. Now, when somebody else starts making huge amounts of money doing something new, other people jump on board, don't they? I mean, back when I was growing up, every basketball player wanted to be like Mike. And then it became Kobe, and now it's LeBron, and everybody wants to copy success, right? 
You don't copy failure, you copy success. This, this is what begins the age of exploration. And it's gonna lead to a flourishing of European civilization. We looked last time at how this leads to the Renaissance. And so as the Renaissance is exploding, starting in 1350, you're only about a hundred years away from the beginning of the age of exploration. And they're all being fed by all this money that's coming in through trade. And that's going to encourage Europeans to go even further, take greater risks. Well, geez, if we go here to an area we know and find goods, what could we find over here, an area we haven't been, or maybe way up here, or gosh, maybe out into the Atlantic? And thus begins the age of exploration. New technologies. Well, they're not new technologies, but they're new to Europeans, okay? They start to make their way into Europe from other parts of the world. We see some pretty simple technologies. The astrolabe. This is an invention of the Islamic world. It's a rather simple technology, but it can be used to figure out where you are on the earth, sort of, okay? So they could figure out through the use of the sextant, sextant, the, the, that's this, and the astrolabe, you can figure out using this, these technologies where you are east and, excuse me, north and south on the globe. But you can't figure out where you are east or west. So that's going to make the age of exploration a little bit more complex. We'll talk about that as a little bit as we go on. So both of these are inventions of the Middle East. The compass. I mean, this seems so simple, but this is an invention of China. And so as Europeans start trading, they start discovering for themselves these technologies that are new to them and bringing them into Europe. The, probably the most important is the creation of new and stronger and bigger ships. The classic model is the caravel. And again, this comes out of the Islamic world, the great trade of the Indian Ocean. Before the Atlantic, the Indian Ocean was the center of world trade for thousands of years. And so these, we looked last time at Henry the Navigator. He ends up establishing schools and starting to send out these navigators and starting to bounce around. But why? What are they looking for out there? By far, the two most important things. The old phrase was God, gold, and glory. That was the old phrase. And, and many people, this, this does a pretty good job of explaining what Europeans were going for. But I think the order is a little bit wrong because almost always the number one thing they're looking for is gold. And that's because Europeans had chosen gold as their means of exchange. But does anybody know how much gold is found in Europe? None. Big fat zero. So where were they getting all their gold from? Africa. Exactly. Sub-Saharan Africa. And that was controlled by Muslims at the time. So it's kind of like if we had to pay all of our, if we got our money from Al Qaeda or ISIS, would anybody be, be cool with that? Okay, here, ISIS, have some of my goods in exchange for the money that I use. Hell no, nobody likes that. And so we're going to see that all of these explorers are being sent out first for gold. That's the number one priority. But they're also being sent there to convert people to their own religion. And this is where we're going to see, especially the Catholics, are really good at sending out priests, especially Jesuits. The Jesuits are, are the smarty pants of the Catholic world, okay? Almost all Catholic universities are run by Jesuits. These are the intellectuals of the Catholic Church, and they were really at the forefront of spreading the faith. This is why to this day, most Catholics don't live in Europe. Where do most Catholics in the world live? Uh, Latin America. Exactly, excellent, Jacob. Yeah, one of the defining features of Latin America uh, is Catholicism still to this day. Now it's waning in popularity, but that's because of these Jesuits. They are going out with these explorers on every one of these vessels, and the people who don't die from disease or conquest are being converted. 
And we see that spread all throughout Latin America. It's one of the defining features. So who are the first of these guys? We mentioned before Eric the Red and Leif Erikson. They began actually, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, Jake. Oh, I was going to say Henry the Navigator. Yeah, okay. But this is, comes a little bit before that. In fact, about 300 years. We'll get to him in just a second, okay? But I love how I love the preview. Thank you. So about the same time that the Crusades are beginning, we're also seeing continued rave, ravaging by and raids by the Vikings. So Leif Eric, excuse me, Eric the Red. So he is, whoops. He's the first of these Vikings to really begin exploring beyond his the borders of his uh, region. Sean, did you have a question? Uh, no, sorry. Okay, no, cool. That's fine. I'd, I'd rather ask. So here's the thing. Think about this. Eric the Red was thrown out of, he was exiled from his city for being a bad Viking. How bad of a person do you have to be to be too violent for a Vikings to allow you to stay? Apparently, Eric the Red was a very bad man. He takes his son and he's exiled. This is not, he doesn't explore by choice. He has to find a place to live. And so he starts exploring the North Atlantic, discovering what he calls uh, uh, Iceland and then Greenland, and then establishing here that small colony Las Majon, uh, that I mentioned last time, in Newfoundland. So he's the first significant explorer. But the thing is, the Vikings, they're illiterate people, but they use runes, which is kind of a, a, a early kind of rough alphabet. But they don't write these things down. It's more of an oral history. So other Europeans don't really believe these stories of explorations and of massive islands out in the Atlantic. It's not really until, as Jacob mentioned, until the 1440s with our friend Henry the Navigator. He's the one who really bring, begins to bring all these elements together. The caravel, these new technologies, better map making, and a whole lot of money to fund this exploration. So, first wave comes from Spain and Portugal. The first wave of, and, and we can still call this exploration at first, because when we look at these early explorers coming out of the Iberian Peninsula, these men, and they're all men, are really just curious. At the most, they're setting up colonies, and really those colonies are supposed to be there to explore and to trade. But... We're going to see very quickly that within a generation, this is going to switch from exploration to conquest or what I often refer to as exploitation. So there was a period early on in European exploration where it really just was about finding out what's out there, whether that means what land masses, what people or what goods are out there to be traded for. But we're going to see that it doesn't take long for Europeans to realize that they have better technology than most of the rest of the, certainly the Western Hemisphere, the Americas. And that's going to turn them into exploiters. And they're going to start to conquer this area. We looked at Columbus. His four journeys end up establishing the foundation for the Spanish claims to all of Central America, all of what today we would call Latin America. And these explorations, and that's exactly what they are at first, um, are going to establish that foundation. We also got men like uh, Bartolomeo Diaz. Diaz, I mentioned before, he makes his way across the Cape of Good Hope into the Indian Ocean, and this this is at the time there are ships from India and China and Southeast Asia and Africa that almost literally fill the Indian Ocean at this time. This is the center of world trade. And for the first time, Europeans tap into that. It's like the first time you went to Walmart. They're like, damn, look at all this stuff. Europeans had, hadn't seen these spices and goods ever before. When Diaz and his men returned, their ship was stuffed with so much spice that Diaz and every man on board that ship got rich enough to retire. 
Imagine that. One run and you make enough money to retire. Would you do that? Would it matter what you're carrying? Would you really care? I mean, one run, guys. Isn't this the American dream? You work hard, you get lucky, and then you can sit on your ass and play games for the rest of your life? Who doesn't want that, right? This sets off the Colombian exchange. Quite honestly, Columbus and his explorations really aren't that important. He doesn't even, I mean, at the end of his life, he still thinks that he's in, in Asia. He's entirely wrong. But <clears throat> he does set off a global trade. This is the first truly global exchange. And this global exchange is, well, plants, animals, people, and diseases. All of these are going to transform the globe in some ways, in positive ways, in other ways, very negative. For example, so a lot of the foods that we use today had never been seen before by Europeans. Can you imagine tomatoes are a product of the new world? What the hell did Italians cook before they discovered tomatoes? Like no pizza, no I mean, that like Alfredo sauce, ugh, ugh, gross, ugh, that stuff's terrible. Pesto, slap your mother, shut up. I mean, what did they eat? Oh, gross. You know, they, there were no peanuts or potatoes. Oh, my God. What? I mean, how am I going to get angry that Taco Bell doesn't serve their those pota uh, their, the, the nacho fries? Come on, people. Bring back the nacho fry. Make America great again. Sorry. Bad joke. Whatever. Okay. So we didn't even have those. They didn't exist in the old world. So all of these foods, they are going to greatly improve the diets of Europeans and of Africans. And that's especially important because as the slave trade out of Africa increases, the population of Africa would have been wiped out in a hundred years if it weren't for this improvement of their diet. Guys, until the 20th century and the creation of vaccines, this is the biggest leap in life expectancy we have ever seen. People went from an average of living just 43 years in the Middle Ages, okay? 43. Guys, think about that. That means your life is already half over. No wonder you married at like 12 and started having kids at 13. Of course, you were a freaking adult because you were going to die in 20 years. By the end of the age of exploration and the dawn of the uh, Enlightenment, the average age is 72. Look at that. And all of that is because of improved diets. All of that. So more sources of protein, more food, and this is being spread throughout Europe and Africa and on into Asia as well. So some great positive benefits. And we also get great things like when you mix these together. So you have cacao from the new world and sugarcane from the old world. You put these together and you create chocolate, which, which gives life meaning. OK, it, without that, I, I, I would I would have choked my kids out by now. But that's a different story, okay? Plants, animals, people. This is also when we get the massive exchange that we call the Atlantic slave trade. Because to mass produce all of these goods, eventually tobacco and rice and eventually cotton, well, labor is needed. We're going to look at that in a lot more detail. And I've mentioned that before but probably the most devastating of all of these is going to be disease. And you can see the list here. Look at all these diseases, that all of these that Europeans brought with them to the new world. And those people of the new world hadn't been exposed to these any of these diseases. And so they drop like, I call it an ecological bomb. We know that population rates in the new world dropped by 90% in just 100 years. Hear that. 90% in 100 years. 
Our best estimates is that the population of the New World, of North and Central and South America, was about 200 million Native Americans before Europeans arrived. Within 100 years, that was down to 20 million. Within another 100 years, that is down to 1 million. The word for this is genocide. And in fact, this makes Hitler look like a punk. Hitler couldn't come anywhere near this. And the thing is, all of this was accidental. It's not like Europeans knew what disease was. Remember, they're still operating in a world in which bad air made you sick or your humors in your body were imbalanced. So they would do weird things like bleeding you or all kinds of funky stuff, okay? They had no idea what disease was. And the age of, you know, infecting smallpox blankets and giving those to Native Americans, that doesn't come until the 19th century. This almost 200 million human beings dying of disease. Guys, that right there, that is how Europeans became fabulously rich. So they moved into that land that Native Americans had owned and they took it because they could, because Native Americans could not. They were physically incapable of resisting. Trust me, just think about how you feel when you have the flu. Are you gonna get up and put on your uniform and go fight? Can you? What if I added, say, smallpox on top of that? What if I added you trying to care for your ancestors as they take their last breath? Guys, this is gonna make Europe fabulously rich, but at an incredible cost, and one that we just don't talk about enough. We can talk about genocide all day, and we will in this class. When we get to World War I, World War II, those familiar stories, but we need to remember this. This is the first truly great global genocide, and it was all an accident. But once Europeans are able to discover this new world, they're going to start fighting about it almost immediately. We spoke before about the Treaty of Tordesilla and how they divide the world between the Portuguese and the Spanish. But all that does is that encourages others to come behind. Then we start getting people like Ferdinand Magellan, who sails around the world, this circumnavigation of the globe. And then everybody else starts jumping in on this. Then come the Dutch. So then we get the second wave. That equals the Dutch, the French, and the last of these, the last European country to get involved in this great age of exploration are the English. But what's really fascinating is the English will, in the end, end up winning, in many ways, the age of exploration. They'll gain by far the most colonies and control around the world over time. So here's the great story. You don't have to be the first to be the best. In fact, sometimes it's to great advantage to allow somebody else to lead that race. Anybody know what drafting is? If you're doing this, and, and I hate to use, you know, like sport, like car racing, because I'm not a fan, but you can do this in if you're physically racing. The person in front of you, you actually run behind them, and they're doing the hard work of cutting through that wind. That wind resistance is hurting them. Meanwhile, you're just coasting behind them until they tire, and then you slingshot past them. And that's exactly what the English will do. They'll allow the Spanish and the, the Portuguese and even the French and the Dutch to do the hard work of establishing colonies, and then the English will come in and conquer those once they're well-established. They'll take their time. They'll build a massive navy, a huge armada, and eventually they're going to take over most of the world. That's the story we'll finish a little bit. We'll finish up next time. This is eventually going to lead to making England the center of what becomes the Industrial Revolution. Now that doesn't emerge until about 1750, but that right there, ladies and gentlemen, this is gonna be the single greatest and largest transformation in the way that people live and work in world history. But we're getting a little ahead of ourselves. I'll save that one for next time, okay? So, hey, I think we're kind of caught up we busted through the age of exploration. Next time, we are going to burn it all down because we're going to look at the age of revolutions that are going to come out of this. We'll look at the American, the French, the Haitian, and the Latin American revolutions. 
So strap in, make sure you're keeping up with the reading, keeping up with the homework. If you got any questions, hang out. I'm here. Otherwise, thanks for coming. And I'll see y'all on Wednesday. See y'all later. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great. Have a great. Yeah. Thank you, Doug. Thank you, Jacob.